Hi, in this uh, informal lecture, I would like to discuss and explore the WBS, the network diagram, and the critical path, and just give you a high level appreciation of each of these. You may recall in the lecture that we briefly addressed the WBS, and uh, in that lecture we considered a plane, so the building or construction of a plane uh, was briefly touched upon in the lecture. Building on that example, let's say we had to build a plane, and so we had a bunch of requirements associated with the plane, uh, let's say, so these were requirements And we could then try to explore how those requirements might impact the various components of the plane. So let's look at a few components like the cockpit, perhaps the cabin, wings, and so on. So we might have a half dozen or so or maybe a dozen components. Now first of all I have not built planes for a living and so I'm using this component breakdown purely as a means of illustration as one possible way of taking these requirements, and there could be many hundreds of these, let's say we have 500 requirements, so taking these requirements and determining how they impact the various components of the plane. There's nothing sacred about the component approach. For example, instead of cockpit, cabin, wings, etc., I could have chosen functionality. I could have chosen avionics, electronics, mechanics, hydraulics, and so on. That would be yet another way to explore how the requirements might impact the plane as a whole. Yet another way to break down requirements could be to break them by organization. Maybe that when a plane is built, uh, one organization here does a part of the work, another organization does another part, and so on. Now, I use the word work because scope is really about what the product or service does and what the people do to get the product or service to perform what it is supposed to perform. So it's the requirements of the product plus the work. So just to recap, I'm using a component breakdown, which does not always have to be the case. But no matter how I break down, whether it is by component or functionality or organization or whatever else, the key goal is to identify 100% of the work. So imagine now that I wanted to build a plane and all I had done was determine how the requirements break out by component, that's not enough detail to really build a plane. You could say, well, maybe I could have a little write-up for each of these components, explaining in detail, maybe using some pictures, and depicting in some way how those requirements impact each component. For example, I could show a picture of the cockpit and say, here's how it looks under the new requirements. Here's how it's different from cockpits of previous kinds of planes we built. So that would give us some idea of how exactly the requirements might impact the cockpit. But even that is not good, en good enough to start building the plane. So we might say then, well, perhaps we should break down cockpit into several more levels. 
So let's break them down. Let's say the cockpit had three components and maybe one of those components further decomposed into two and maybe this decomposed into three other subcomponents and so on. And perhaps we could also do this for the other components here, breaking them down into subcomponents. Because each of those, let's say I want to build a cabin, there would be a lot of things to do. You know, I got to install the seats, uh, the, the luggage overhead bins and so on, uh, the carpeting in the cabin. So there's lots of things to do. And you can see why I need to break things up. So maybe here I break up into two and so on. So let's draw a few more boxes and it doesn't necessarily mean that every component here has to break down to equal levels. So some could go really deep. As you can see here on the wings I'm going really deep. But now there's a question. How deep do I need to go? You can go ridiculously deep, for example, you could say that when I break down the wings, uh, there comes a point when I have to hammer in uh, 50 nails or screw 50 screws in. And do I want to have one box for each nail? You know, hammer in nail one, hammer in nail two, and you're going to tell me uh, that's really ridiculous because you don't need to go to that level of detail. On the other hand, just stopping at wings might be too high because you may say, well, uh, how do I really install the wings? How do I test them? I need to have more detail. So there is one extreme where there's too little detail and that would be if I were to stop at wings or maybe stop at one of these boxes, the detail would be too little. And there's the other extreme where I would have ridiculous amount of detail and that would be the level of maybe saying, you know, I got to hammer in nail one and hammer in nail two and therefore I need 50 boxes because I have 50 nails. So then the million dollar question is, where do I stop the decomposition? I have one level that's really too high, another that's ridiculously detailed. So there must be some golden mean uh, where I can stop the decomposition. And how do we articulate that? And the best way to articulate that is you stop when you as the project manager feel you can manage at that level. So if you feel that you can manage this box at this level, then you stop the decomposition. Now, that's not to say that whoever inherits this box, it might be some engineer on the shop floor, that box may break down into a thousand more activities or details and so on. And uh, obviously, you know, you would let that engineer decompose, but from the project manager's point of view, you are managing at this level. So what does managing at this level mean? Managing at that level means you can estimate, track, control, and trust at that level. And trust meaning that sometimes you might want a little bit more insight into what someone is doing based on your previous association or networking with them. For example, if you have a brand new employee, you might want to see a little bit more detail. You might ask that employee to break this box down perhaps into two or three more. And if this employee here was fairly experienced, then you might say, well, this level of visibility is okay. And we all do that. And of course, uh, the extreme form of, you know, making people break down work and managing every little detail that is micromanagement and you don't want to do that. But clearly uh, if you can estimate, track, control and trust at a level uh, you are good stopping at that level. It will be better to stop at that level. You meaning the project manager. So this is the project manager's view of the work. Now these boxes here at the high level those are called uh, deliverables. And the boxes at the lowest level that have nothing below them, meaning the boxes that don't have kids, so to speak, all of these, these are called work packages.
and sometimes we have admin information in each box so you know I'm going to put a little small box there these little pieces of administrative information might be the name of the manager or engineer perhaps assigned to that box uh, it could be accounting information the accounting number to which you are uh, charging work performed in that box and you can have these admin pieces of information at any level right so you could even have one there one there and so on so little pieces of information uh, that say something about that box who owns it what might be the rough order of magnitude uh, schedule for that and so on but note that this picture by itself is really devoid of any schedule and or cost implications we're not looking at schedule and cost here we are not looking at dependence WBS or work breakdown and structure is to identify 100% of the work so this picture is the WBS work breakdown structure as I said earlier these are the deliverables and these lower level uh, packages the ones that do not have any kids so to speak are the ones that we call the work packages and so it's pretty clear from here that if you add up all the work packages in other words the totality of all the work packages is really all the work on the project note that if I add these two I don't need that box because this box is really the sum of these two likewise um, the sum of these two is that box so I don't need this box really because it breaks down into these two so ultimately if you add up all the work packages you get all the work so this is the work breakdown structure in your team exercise you really should come up with deliverables so these are the high level types of work you want to do and maybe you can come up with three or four deliverables then you break down to however many levels you want and you stop at the work packages and for your team exercise you might have oh, 15 20 25 uh, no sorry not 15 20 25 you might have maybe 8 or 10 work packages so try to keep the number of work packages uh, on your team exercise to about 8 10 12 so now that you have one view of the work the work package level and the sum of all the work packages all the work you have you might start thinking about schedule so what we just did here is really taking care of the WBS which falls under scope now we're thinking of time so we're moving our focus we're shifting our focus a little bit and saying what about the schedule how long does it take to do all this work and when it comes to schedule there are really two things that matter most and that is the sequencing of the work and the number of resources you have now you may recall from one of the lectures uh, that you've listened to and you hopefully have listened to it uh, before you're watching this uh, informal uh, video here in one of the lectures we gave the example of painting the walls and building the walls and we said that that example illustrates the fact that while stopping at the work package level is a good level to stop at for the project manager so from the project managers point of view uh, the work package level is ideal because it doesn't have too much detail and it doesn't have too little from a sequencing point of view in other words capturing the dependencies between all types of work in this WBS from that point of view the WBS work package level is not optimal and you may recall the paint the walls build the walls example from one of the uh, five minute videos that you watched so you do need to break these work packages down into further levels of detail okay and when you break down a work package into further levels of detail then you get a uh, set of activities and we discussed that too in 
the lecture that you want to break down some work packages into activities and any work package that does not break down into activities would be really uh, one that has a dual status it would be uh, a work package obviously and an activity too. So any work package that does not break down further into activities is both a work package and an activity. And remember that the whole reason we break down into activities is to get better sequencing. So in the example in the video we said we wanted to break down build wall 1 into four activities. Build wall 1, build wall 2, build wall 3, and build wall 4. Likewise you could break down paint wall 1 into paint wall 1, paint wall 2, paint wall 3, and paint wall 4. And that would give you a better sequencing, like we discussed in the video. And if that's not clear to you, I would suggest maybe you go back and listen to that part of the video, because that is an important concept, that breaking down a work package into activities uh, helps you to better capture dependencies. And if it does not help you to better capture dependencies, you can probably leave the work package just the way it is and keep it uh, in its work package status and it would also have a dual activity status. So, the reason we broke down some or maybe all of the work packages if that was necessary into activities <coughs> was to better capture dependencies between work. And the reason we wanted to better capture dependencies was because we wanted to get the best possible schedule. So then the question is, if I have my activities, how do I move towards the schedule? So since the key reason for breaking down work packages into activities was to capture dependencies, let's try to capture those dependencies. And one of the ways you can do that is using a network diagram. So you would have a start node and then any of the activities, so remember the activities are not shown in this picture, uh, but you do have a chart in one of the videos that shows you a network diagram and I'm just sort of giving you the, the reasoning and appreciation behind that, why we need to do that and how you do that. So you have a start node and anything that does not need prior work, in other words, anything that does not have a dependency, it doesn't depend on anything else, would start right on day one and you would make it come out of the start node. So let's say you had activity A, B, and C that could essentially start on day one. They did not depend on any other work. Then they emanate from the start node. But let's say that activity D is dependent on activity A, then you would show it that way. And let's say D is also dependent on B. And let's say E is dependent on C. And F is dependent on B. And let's have a few more. Say so G is dependent on D and on F. H is dependent on F, I is dependent on F, and let's say all three of these are dependent on, or J depends on all three of these, and after you finish J, let's say you're completed, then you show that with a finish box. So this is called a network diagram. So this picture here is called a network diagram. Now this is a good way to show dependencies. Another way you can show dependencies is using predecessors and some of the tools like Microsoft Project generally uh, make it very obvious that you could do that. Uh, so for example Let's say you have activity A, uh, and then you say, what are the predecessors? So if this is the activity, let's list the predecessors. So let's draw a little line here to separate all of this stuff. So you have a predecessor column. So you may say A depends on nothing else. 
you put a blank. So meaning A starts on day one. Uh, B depends on nothing else. C depends on nothing else. But D depends on A and B. So you'd show that here D depends on A and B. And so on. So you can now try to do this for all of the activities. But this particular view, the predecessor view, is fraught with risks. Because if you have hundreds of activities, you could run into strange situations. So let me just give you an example. Let's say you have activity L here that's dependent on J, K, and X. And then you go down here and let's say you have activity X that's dependent on A, B, and J. Now you can clearly see that this is untenable because activity X here is dependent on A, B, and J. Oh, I'm sorry, let's say A, B, and L. So A, B, and L. Okay, A, B, and L. So if activity X is dependent on L, but L is dependent on X, that is not sound, right? L depends on X, and X depends on L. So that's like a deadly embrace. Uh, each cannot start without the other, and that's going to cause you problems. You have a cyclic dependency. Now, in this particular case, it was easy for the eyes to catch it, because you could just look at L depending on X, and X depending on L, and you can say, no, you can't do that. But if you had hundreds of activities, and all of these kinds of dependencies, then the human eye cannot catch cyclic or circular dependencies. However, you can catch it using the network diagram, because in the network diagram, you show dependencies from left to right. And you show them from left to right, and therefore, if you have a situation like this, where L depends on X, that means L would have to be to the right of X. And then when you come here, X depends on L, X would have to be to the right of L. But L cannot be to the right and left of X. That's impossible, so you would catch that. So the network diagram is a better way to capture dependencies. Now once you've captured dependencies, you look at resources and say, what kind of resources are needed for each of these activities? How much of them do I have? When do I have them? And so on. And based on the availability of resources, you can then put durations on each of these. So let's go ahead and put some durations here. Let's say 4, 5, 8, 9, 7, 2, 6, 10, 11, and 7. Right? So this is the duration. Let's say those are weeks. Now, how do you find the actual schedule? You would take all paths from beginning to end or start to finish, like A, D, G, J, B, D, G, J, B, F, H, J, C, E, I, J, and so on. List all the paths from beginning to end. Now, for one such path, you can find the total duration. So if I were to look at A, D, G, J, it would be 4 plus 2, 6 plus 6, 12 and 7, 19 weeks. So A, D, G, J takes 19 weeks. Now, if you look at all the paths from beginning to end and add up the durations on the, of the activities on that path, you get a number for each of the start to finish paths. Now, the start to finish path that has the longest total duration, that is called the critical path. So the critical path is the longest path through the network. There could be more than one critical path, but typically if you increase the number of critical paths, then you increase the schedule risk, because on a critical path, no activity can slip, right? Because if you look at the longest path from beginning to end, that is really the duration of the project. And if you were to slip even one of the activities on that path, then you are extending the duration of the project. If you have more critical paths, so more than one critical path, then you have more activities that cannot slip, so you are increasing your schedule risk. 
So that's how you get the schedule by looking at the longest path from the beginning to the end. Now what about cost? For cost, you would cost out each of these nodes. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. You would cost out each of those nodes. And from that cost, you could build what is known as an S-curve. So let me just give an example here. Let's say that A costs $4,000. So I'm going to put that as 4K. Let's say B costs 10K and C costs 40k. Now, if I were to ask you, how much money do I spend in the first week? Assuming that all of the duration numbers, 4, 2, 6, 7, 10, etc., those are in weeks. Now, this is typically not an easy question because when we spend money, we do not usually spend it in a linear way. We might spend more up front, uh, perhaps a little bit in the middle and then more toward the end, or we could spend it evenly. There's many ways in which the, the burn rate of money can be distributed. It doesn't have to be uniform. So if I look at this 4K here spread across four weeks for activity A, it could be that I spend 3K the first week and then 1K over the next three weeks. Possible. And just to make things simple, let's assume it's linear. In other words, this 4K is spent evenly across the four weeks, which would mean that I spend 1K every week. Likewise for B, 10K spent over five weeks, and let's say it's a uniform or even spend rate, we would say that we spend roughly 10 divided by five, or $2,000 per week for B, and likewise 40 divided by 8, $5,000 per week for C. So in the first week, I'm spending 40 divided by 8, which is 5, 5 plus 10 divided by 5, which is 2, so 5 plus 2, 7, plus 4 divided by 4, which is 1, so 5 plus 2 plus 1, 7 plus 1, 8. In the first week, I spend 8K. And then I could draw a picture, right? I could say, this is my time, and this is cumulative cost, so note the word cumulative, cumulative cost. And so in the first week, we said 5 plus 2 plus 1, so 8. So week 1, I would have 8 here. Likewise, in week two, I'm still working on A, B, and C, and the same calculation would say in week two, I also spend eight, but I don't put eight here, I put 16, okay? So this is one point, and this is another point. Why 16? Because in the first two weeks, I spent eight plus eight, 16, and I'm looking at my cumulative cost, okay, since the beginning. Now, if you have an assuming uniform spend rate, you could tell me how much I'm going to spend in week three, four, five, etc. After you're done with that, you really would have plotted what is known as the S curve. So this is called an S curve. It looks like an elongated S. I didn't draw it too well. Typically, it kind of looks like this. Okay? So S curve. This is your S curve. Of course, you might now say, well, you made an unrealistic assumption. You assume that the spending is even. Well, I made that assumption simply because I could explain this to you in a few minutes. But even if that were not true, let's say I had a different spending pattern. Well, then I will just use that different spending pattern, whatever the pattern is, and incorporate that into the calculation, but I would still get an S-curve. It, it would just be different from the one I have, but I can still get it. So this S-curve is capturing the cost. So once again, to recap, the WBS captures the work. The network diagram and critical path capture the schedule, and the S-curve captures the cost. And these are the three that you will be putting together in your team exercise. So you want to remember in your team exercise, maybe have three or four deliverables. Uh, 
break them down into roughly 8, 10, 12 work packages. I would advise you to keep the total number of activities, meaning the nodes here on the network diagram, to maybe 20, 25. Because if you go over 25, you know, you could run into uh, a lot of headaches and uh, it may not be possible to complete this in a reasonable amount of time. So try to keep the activities to 25 or so, plus or minus a few. And then you would use this network diagram to come up with the S-curve. Okay, so that's it. I hope this helps uh, make your team exercise uh, a little bit more meaningful and tractable.